This is PDV Bulls. I am Sayyid Shubhat Ali, and you are watching Fault Lines. Once again, we are bringing you a recap of all the major events that have taken place in this week and have caught attention in the international media. First and foremost was the terrorist attack that has hit Taksim Square, Istanbul. Istanbul, that is the tourism capital of Turkey, was hit by a bomb blast. Though this is not the tourism season, yet Istanbul has a great significance for the tourism industry of the country. PKK, an international terrorist outfit that has an alliance with YPG, another organization that is involved in Syrian war and is a front line ally with the US military, was nominated as being responsible for this event. The Syrian minister of Turkey refused to take the condolence from the government of the United States. 42 people, along with two main accused, have been arrested within 24 hours of the event. What are behind the scene events that have caused this particular attack to take place? How is it linked with the political developments that are taking uh, place in the background? How is it going to affect Turkey's economy and what the government of Turkey is thinking about it? All of this in today's program. Team Fault Lines have prepared a package. Watch the package before I bring my first guest to program. Six people were killed and 81 others were wounded when an explosion rocked a popular shopping and tourism spot in central Istanbul. President Tayyip Erdogan condemned the vile attack and stated that the relevant units of the state are working to find the perpetrators. World leaders extended their condolences and expressed their regret at the incident. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has called the explosion shocking. Turkish police have arrested 46 people and Interior Minister Suleiman Solu blamed the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party PKK for deadly blast whereas Turkish authorities are not ruling out ISIL involvement. Pakistan has strongly condemned the heinous terrorist attack in Turkey as Istanbul city, which resulted in loss of precious lives. In a statement, Foreign Office spokesperson said Pakistan firmly stands with brotherly people of Turkey in the fight against the scourge of terrorism. Meanwhile, President Dr. Al Falvi, Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif and Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari have also expressed deep grief over the loss of precious lives in Istanbul explosion. The explosion was a shocking reminder of the anxiety that gripped Turkey several years ago when Turkey was hit by a string of deadly bombings by ISIS and outlawed Kurdish groups between 2015 and 17. The attempt to take over Turkey and the Turkish nation through terrorism will not reach its goal today or tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, to join me from Brussels, my first guest in program is Professor Talaha Kose. He is director of CETA. And CETA is a non-governmental think tank uh, based in Brussels. Professor Kose, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. First things first. So what exactly has happened in Istanbul? People in Pakistan are quite afraid about these sad developments that have shook entire Turkey. Uh, as you know, Taksim Square is one of the, uh, Istanbul's most, most crowded uh, areas. Uh, usually tourists and people who visit the city uh, hang around uh, and there are you know, nice cafes and shopping centers. It's a very crowded uh, area, so and it has also uh, quite a, a tourist population coming from all around the world. So uh, we know that in the past, Taksim Square has been targeted, or some uh, several terror attack efforts have been prevented by uh, Turkish uh, police, Turkish security uh, forces in the past. We also know that in uh, 2016 there was another attack around Taksim Square, but it's a very cosmopolitan. An area which is visited by too many uh, people. So uh, at uh, exactly around 4:30 p.m., uh, Istanbul, uh, a bomb exploded uh, in a, uh, one of the crowded areas around the Taksim uh, Square. So uh, according to the video footage, uh, a middle-aged woman have left uh, the the bomb there and uh, then uh, moved to the area. So he, she probably sit there around 40, 45 minutes according to the video footage. But unfortunately, uh, six civilians have died and uh, more than uh, 50 people have been uh, injured. Professor Kose, you said Syrian nationals have been found involved and there is a link established between these attackers and YPG. Now, for the sake of consumption of the viewers of this program who might not be 
much updated about the political developments in Turkey. Can you give us a, a bit of background about YPG? Why YPG is so significant and why is it against the government of Turkey? Actually, YPG is a Syrian branch of uh, PKK. As you know, uh, after the uh, civil war in Syria, uh, those uh, organizations, with the help of uh, U.S. and a couple of other countries, has controlled uh, the north uh, eastern part of uh, Syria. So, of course, they legitimize their efforts uh, to fight against ISIS at that time, but they have been continuing their uh, separation, separatist struggles in Turkey, PKK. So. Uh, they have. They should be considered as the, under the same umbrella, uh, PKK, YPG, and the Iranian uh, branch of uh, PKK. They are uh, all part of the same organizational structures, uh, and they have been controlled under the same uh, umbrella. We also know that it is fragmented uh, at certain uh, local levels. Uh, they have been claiming the control of certain districts of Syria and trying to establish their uh, self-rule. Uh, but in the last several years, after the successful anti-terror operations and uh, the struggle, uh, the organizations PKK cannot function within the boundaries of uh, Turkey. So they cannot uh, recruit uh, their militants, uh, terrorists from Turkey as well, but they are still uh, very strong in Syria under the American protection uh, in the northeast part of uh, Syria. They have been provided certain weapons, and unfortunately, those uh, weapons have been sm smuggled, and those militant ter terrorists have been uh, moving to Turkey from uh, transporter. Uh, operations. So we have to consider these all these elements. So PKK, YPG uh, in Syria, uh, Iraq, and Turkey together, they have been uh, ruled, governed by similar structure. Professor Talha, I I'm sorry to cut you here, but this gives birth to another very important, rather an interesting question. You might find it a bit tricky as well. This rift between uh, YPG and, and government of Turkey. Do you believe this is primarily a reason why U.S. is upset with Turkey, or is it an outcome of U.S. is being upset with the government of Turkey? Is it a reason or an outcome of the developments that have taken place between uh, United States and Turkey? Uh, unfortunately, after the uh, Syrian civil war, uh, especially the American security forces, Pentagon decided to work with uh, YPG, to counter ISIS. So despite Turkey's presence as a strong NATO ally, they decided to arm, equip, and train YPG. And they thought that, or they argued that, PKK and YPG are different organizations. But if you look at the organizational structure, organizational frame of uh, these, uh, they are very much uh, connected. And the trainings, the weapons that are produced, that are provided in YPG also passes to PKK. So uh, this is the major uh, rift between Turkey and US. I mean, uh, despite Turkey's criticism, uh, the Americans continue to support uh, this organization. And despite the arguments that Americans, uh, the weapons will only be used in uh, northeast Syria and I against ISIS, we all know that those weapons also has been transferred to different areas within the boundaries of Turkey. Uh, I think this is the major rift between Turkey and U.S. And not, uh, you know, U.S. is not helping Turkey in struggle against terrorism. And unfortunately, they continue to support and sponsor YPG, which also is very much connected with the PKK. Mr. Talha, Kose, what, what are the problems of PKK with, with Turkey? Why PKK wants to fight? I mean, we understand that's fighting against the government since quite long. What's the background of their issue, specifically? PKK is a terrorist organization that has been established in uh, late 1970s. In the earlier periods, uh, it was a left-wing revolutionary movement that are supported primarily by 
um, you know, Kurdish uh, militants at that time. So, of course, as a part of uh, this Cold War, uh, you know, uh, tension, uh, all these organizations have been sponsored. But starting, and they started their four, uh, first terrorist attacks against Tur uh, Turkey, Turkish civilians in 1984. So since then, uh, under the leadership of Abdullah Öcalan, they continued their um, terror attacks against civ civilians. They targeted civilians who do not, especially the Kurds, who do not uh, align with them uh, in the region. They targeted Turkish security officials. They exploded bombs in the uh, cities. So, uh, in the beginning, they argued that maybe in the early 80s, they wanted to claim that they, they this is a revolutionary uh, people's uh, fight against uh, Turkish government, Turkish state. Uh, and starting from the 90s, uh, due to the uh, power vacuum in uh, Iraq, uh, they expanded uh, the control certain areas in the northern parts of the uh, Iraq and Kurdistan regional uh, government uh, areas. But they also were very strong in uh, southeast and eastern parts of Turkey. Turkey. So uh, this struggle against the PKK has been going on uh, for more than 40 years, where more than 40,000 Turkish uh, citizens has been uh, killed and uh, more than 100,000 has been injured uh, because of this. So this struggle has been going on for more than 40 years, but after the uh, American invasion of Iraq and uh, the civil war in Syria, uh, those organizations found uh, places uh, to expand further and because of the ongoing civil wars they has been they have been sponsored by, both by the regional countries as well as great uh, powers professor tala i'm sorry to cut you again but turkey's stance on syria has been quite confusing for many and people in this part of world do not understand it correctly because much of the things that we hear about turkey's stance on syria comes from the western newspapers uh, so, please give us a Turkish perspective on how Turkey looks at Syrian war and, and its strategy with regards to the challenges that has been set forth as an aftermath of Syrian war. I mean, Turkey has more than 900 uh, kilometers borders with Syria and more than 400 kilo kilometers uh, border with Iraq. So, as you know, uh, due to this uh, civil war, the borders has uh, being uh, unprotected and certain terrorist groups and extremist elements have been situated uh, in Turkey's uh, uh, borders. So PKK is one of the actors they find uh, refuge. And but not only the PKK, but other organizations like ISIS, uh, you know, Daesh, Al Qaeda related elements have also been situated in Turkey. So in 2014, 15, 16, all these elements started to uh, attack uh, Turkey. They tried to smuggle weapons. They tried to smuggle uh, drugs. Uh, they tried to recruit some militants, terrorists uh, from Turkey. They wanted to use Turkey, Turkish border for, uh, you know, sponsoring uh, their uh, activities. So in uh, 2014, 15, 16, it was very difficult for Turkey to control the borders. So in order to protect the borders, Turkey did uh, four uh, cross-border uh, military operation and uh, operations and secured some parts of the border but there are still uh, elements there are still the uh, certain uh, regions especially uh, northeast and some parts of the central uh, you know parts of the Syria are not controlled by Turkish security uh, you know, uh, forces. So, uh, again, as, as I said, because of these cross-border operations and still the presence of Turkish uh, security uh, elements, uh, these attacks have been uh, prevented for a long time. And in Iraq, Turkish security forces have been continuing, uh, the, you know, counter-terrorism operations for the last uh, nine months, and they have been uh, controlling the areas that are uh, dominated in the past by these uh, elements. Thank you very much, Professor Talha Koshe, for being guest in our program today. Thanks for the invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break, and we'll join you back with the second segment of the program. Stay with us.
Welcome back. There has been recently a meeting between President Xi Jinping and President Joe Biden. The meeting took place in, in Indonesia at G20 summit on 14th of November. Now, there was a lot of significance around the subject because both of these leaders, are both the leaders of both the nations, have not met for quite long. And there were a lot of expectations as well because the issue of Taiwan and the issue of trade war between the two sides has brought already enough heat on the table. What have they discussed in the current meeting? What are the problems that both the countries are facing with each other? And what are the possibilities of ironing out the differences? All of this in this segment. Team Fault Lines have prepared a package. Watch the package before I bring my guests to this part of my program. At the G20 summit in Bali, U.S. President Joe Biden held a three-hour talk with his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping. Their first in-person encounter since Biden took office. The meeting provided an opportunity that both sides hope will lead to an improvement in rapidly deteriorating relations. Speaking at a news conference afterward, U.S. President Joe Biden stated that when it comes to China, the U.S. would compete vigorously but not looking for conflict while reiterating that there need not to be a new Cold War. Both leaders expressed their resolve to empower key senior officials on areas of potential cooperation, including tackling the climate crisis and maintaining global financial, health and food stability. According to White House, the two leaders also agreed that a nuclear war should never be fought and could not be won and underscored their opposition to use or threat of use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. The official Chinese news agency Xinhua cited, Xi as saying that the two sides should work with all countries to bring more hope to world peace, greater confidence in global stability and stronger impetus to common development. Amid mounting global challenges, the leaders of two superpowers should act as a ship's rudder and chart the right course to meet fundamental global interest and elevate the relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, to join me from Islamabad on Skype is Dr. Talat Shabir from ISSI. Dr. Talat, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me over. Dr. Talat, what is the significance of this G20 meeting that has taken place? Uh, there were a lot of expectations with regards to this meeting. What do you say about it? Actually, the G G20 forum is a forum that discusses various issues facing the world. But when we particularly talk about this uh, this summit, um, and uh, you know, outcome of this was uh, a meeting uh, between uh, President Joe Biden and uh, President Xi Jinping. So I think it it has got a significance that both the leaders of uh, major powers. They met and uh, they, they discussed issues of uh, mutual concern with each other. Uh, when we talk of mutual concerns, like you know, for past uh, uh, following the uh, Pelosi's visit to uh, Taiwan, there were you know com there was a communication gap between the two countries. There was stoppage of uh, official level communication between the two countries. I think that has started again, and uh, this this meeting is going to. Uh, you know, have good impact on future course of uh, their relationship because it's very important that both the countries, they are in a kind of competition since 2010 and that competition is actually getting swear uh, day by day with various, on, on various uh, issues. Uh, and uh, I think world at, at large is concerned about uh, what is happening between the two countries and world uh, most the, most scholars on china part china and uh, us relations think that this competition may get in into a cold war situation which is going to be very very dangerous for the world dr talat there are many theories uh, every single person that i have interviewed in this regard has a different theory when it comes to the differences between the united states and china what, in your learned opinion, is the reason of differences between these two sides? What exactly sets at the heart of these differences that are taking momentum since 2010? I think it's a very complex uh, situation between the two countries. And you cannot actually uh, figure out one factor that, that is contributing to this competition. I think uh, majorly it is trade between the two countries. You know, in the Trump's time, there was a problem of tariffs. And there were, uh, you know, there, there was a trade between the two countries, and uh, uh, some kind of protectionism actually guided the the stance of United States of America, and trade became a kind of, uh, you know, uh, thorny issue between the two countries. 
then is the technology uh, then is uh, i think uh, both the countries that basically technology is one thing that china is fast you know uh, overtaking america they are you know they are actually focusing on research and development so technology is also one reason that uh, that can be counted towards the this competition another important thing is that china has actually engaged with uh, more than half of the world through belt and road initiative and that actually increases china's influence in those countries uh, who whoever has signed directly or indirectly an agreement with china or with regard to belt and road initiative that means there is a kind of uh, chinese influence in those can, countries so um, the united states think that china probably using belt and road initiative using a, an economic tool is actually expanding strategic presence in the world strategic influence in the world so that is another reason that uh, uh, that is actually counting to this competition uh, there are regional factors also for example in the united states of america is a sports uh, india and uh, chinese think that this kind of containment strategy of uh, america against china so there's a regional uh, not alliance but there's a regional cooperation between the two countries against china then there are a fun, there's a pakistan issue and i think there was a difference of opinion uh, between the two, between the two countries then there is there's there are problems uh, like in hong kong in tibet in xinjiang us uh, uh, scholars in us and officials in us continue to Uh, blame china for human right violation in those uh, in those areas so that is also concern uh, with china so so if i understood you uh, correctly you, you mean there is a robust bouquet of reasons involved uh, in the confrontation between the two sides now uh, recently president xi jinping has revived his political status uh, has taken more strength in the political system of the country uh do you believe that has made him the rightest man if united states is interested to defuse the crisis uh given all the fallout effect that both the economies have faced so far yes i think uh, xi jinping has emerged as the strongest leader in china uh, after mao zedong and uh, you know and there is a legitimate the legitimacy base of uh, you know when uh, chinese communist party and then there's a the national congress which elects uh, uh, the president and they have decided to elect uh, xi jinping for third term i think with this decision uh, xi jinping has uh, emerged as a stronger leader uh, in china and that that actually gives him power to negotiate what uh, uh, china wants to do in the world and how china actually wants to negotiate or uh, navigate uh, you know uh, towards its global influence the, basically that is that is a kind of revival that is very close to xi jinping's heart they they actually they see china as a great country they they see china as a great nation great civilization that is there is a kind of nostalgia that xi jinping shares and uh, i think uh, xi jinping being powerful president uh will definitely move in that direction but uh there there is a you know uh, for example they uh, xi jinping's opinion is that they should have uh, a world of common destiny shared future so he talks of nice things and that developing world is actually buying whereas the united states has a different view from 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 this so i think xi jinping will emerge powerful and uh, he will be in a decisive position to make major decisions towards uh, relationship with the united states but dr shabir my original question was does the revived mandate make xi jinping the rightest man as it is often said he is now the most or one of the most powerful leaders china ever had in their political history yes of course when you know when you are you have a strong footing when you have you are a very strong person at home you are all powerful to make decisions you have uh, backing of the communist party congress uh, national congress and i think you are the right he he becomes the right person to talk to and he is the right person to take right decisions at the moment uh, dr talat recently xi jinping has given his own picture wearing army uniform talking to the senior command of chinese army and has given a statement that china should stay prepared for for a war at any time what does that mean 
Is that an offensive statement or is it to remind the United States that China is fully geared up to defend uh, its own borders if an issue escalates from this point on? Uh, I think uh, uh, while President Xi Jinping talks of uh, economic prosperity, while he talks of maintaining what is they have gained uh, in economic domain, while they uh, uh, you know look at economy as the most important factor, uh, you know you know lifting up their people uh, who, who lived in poverty, uh, while he he's actually people focused policies he he had been pursuing in the past. But he believes that China must have a strong military uh, to defend uh, its uh, borders and to actually uh, be taken taken into account as a great military. So they have uh, set an objective of uh, having a strongest military by 2027. I think uh, they that is that is the way they will balance between you know economic economic strides that they are making. And uh, uh, having a military to you know balance uh, balance because deciding that by 2027 they should have a strongest military is the fact that they they know that it is uh, the need of the time that you have strong military muscle uh, to actually pursue your economic goals. So you believe it's more a gesture of real politic by China. Let's proceed forward. So. Uh, on the Ukrainian front, Russian army has so far not been able to be successful. And that actually reminds us how successful the United States military posture has been. The United States, without moving much of uh, her own assets, has put Europe to almost a full-scale war with, with Russia. And does that serve as a morale booster for the United States, which is looking towards China from an aggressive posture? Uh, yeah, one of the things that both leaders have talked uh, during the brief talk uh, in Bali was that Russia-Ukraine war must not escalate into a nuclear conflict. So I think that is the bottom line that countries should not uh, uh, escalate beyond what can be a dangerous nuclear uh, domain. But I think uh, uh, since uh, the, the 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 gains that Russia is making in the in Ukraine um, are are seen uh, by the Western powers, particularly America, eagerly because they they are looking at uh, United uh, Russia as an aggressor, um, and uh, that is what you know most of the world also shares that it's it is a kind of aggression that that was made by. That was made by Russia over Ukraine. So that actually stays a debate uh, for other countries as well. Because <clears throat> if you support aggression by one big power against a smaller country, so that actually gives a kind of right, or uh, at least you can debate that China can also do something similar act against any any of the uh, any of the country that uh, China thinks is part of their one China policy, but United States think that though they support that one China policy, but it, it has to be, uh, you know, a bilateral action. It shouldn't be a unilateral action by any country or any bigger country. But um, I think the Ukraine-Russia situation is very complex and uh, both countries are cautious when they comment on this and they actually have given a bottom line that you should not cross such uh, a, a limit where uh, you get into a, a nuclear con confrontation. Uh, Dr. Talat, my last question. Uh, China is also under immense economic pressure. According to the official statistics revealed, their economy is not as healthy as it was in year 2021 and before. The United States is facing one of the highest inflation it's in its known history. United Kingdom Europe, Germany are not even doing better. Now, all of this together, I mean, don't you think that these are high times for, for all these economic reasons for the two countries to leave their differences along and, and come together? Would it not be better for the entire global community at large? The, uh, in my sense, uh, the biggest challenge that President Xi Jinping uh, would face in his own country is the, you know, maintaining what they gained. So economic, uh, yes, they have a problems. For example, zero COVID goal in in China is becoming difficult, and there's a lot of problem, and it is it is also affecting its economic uh, indicators. 
So there are other problems that growth they have attained. Is it maintainable or um, they, they'll face problem? I think maintaining growth they attained will become a big problem. And uh, President Xi Jinping will have to uh, address this, this issue at home. And uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and expansion are stretching of his uh, uh, economic domain to countries, more nearly 70 countries in the world. So that is that is a kind of problem that Xi Jinping, I think, will face in, in, in times to come. But I think China will be able to handle uh, handle this because they have a lot of domestic cons consumption of uh, what they uh, they produce, and there's a lot of domestic con consumption of what they they have. So I think uh, though this is a big challenge uh, for for Xi Jinping to maintain the growth China has attained over a period of time. But I think China will be able to uh, manage the, the way they actually have managed uh, recession of 2008 and 9. Uh, I think this time too, China is likely to uh, manage this uh, economic downturn. Thank you very much, Dr. Tal Sabir, for being guest in our program today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break and we'll join you back with the last segment of the program. Stay with us. Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, second important issue that we wanted to cover in today's program is the elections that have taken place in Israel. Now, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has once again won the elections, this time taking 64 seats in a parliament of 120. Let me remind you that since 2019, there have been five elections in Israel. To give you a glimpse of Israel's political turmoil, four of these elections were actually uh, referendum to see if Netanyahu is the right candidate to run on the Prime Minister's office or not. And here he is back with with another crash mandate for another term. Uh, while this might be a good news for many more of his followers, this has not been received very well by the people of Palestine who believe Netanyahu is not the right man to speak to. To talk about this issue at length and to give us an expert insight of the issue, I have uh, invited uh, Dr. Mukhemir Abu Sada, who is professor at Al Azhar University of uh, Gaza, and is joining me from Gaza. Professor Abu Sada, welcome to the program. It's my pleasure to be with you, Mr. Uh, Said. Uh, professor Abu Sada, my first question is about the election of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, Netanyahu is not elected for the first time. He has experience in Prime Minister's office uh, and perhaps is one of the leaders who have served for perhaps the longest time. You can correct me if I'm mistaken. How has his tenure been for Muslims of Palestine at large as compared to the other people who have uh, served before him? Let me again say thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this program. And uh, going back to your uh, question, um, let me also say that Netanyahu is not new to Israeli politics. Uh, Netanyahu has served as a prime minister in Israel uh, for more than any other Israeli prime minister since the creation of Israel in 1948. Netanyahu has already served uh, 15 years in office as a prime minister. Uh, which is more than uh, David Ben-Gurion, who created the State of Israel back in 1948. So therefore, that Netanyahu is very much well known to the Palestinians as, as well as the region and the international community. Uh, we know uh, that Netanyahu, over his uh, premiership uh, between 1996 and 1999, and also between 2009 and 2021, uh, he his his uh, ideology is uh, belong to the so-called right-wing ideology in Israel. Uh, 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 he very much stood against the signing of the Oslo Agreement between Israel and the PLO back in 1993, and that Oslo Agreement was signed between the Labour-led government in Israel, led by. Uh, 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 Israeli uh, uh, late Prime Minister uh, uh, Ishaq Rabin and the chairman of the PLO, Yasser Arafat. 
Uh, the Oslo Agreement was supposed to put an end to the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory and also establish a Palestinian independent and sovereign state in West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. But unfortunately, after the death of Rabin in November of 1995, six months later, Netanyahu was elected. And from the beginning, he uh, did everything uh, he can do to kill the Oslo process, to kill the peace process between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And over uh, the course of his premiership, he expanded Israeli settlement construction on Palestinian territory in the, in the occupied West Bank and also in East Jerusalem. And he waged uh, two wars against Gaza, uh, 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 one in 2012 and the other one 2014, when he was prime minister of Israel. And uh, 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 Therefore, uh, he, he is uh, very much known to the Palestinians that he is anti-peace. He is uh, not uh, 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 supportive of the two-state solution. And he has done everything possible to kill any chance of peace between the Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, 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 very much he is known in Israel as a right wing that he is devoted to the creation of a greater Israel which expands from the Mediterranean to the Jordanian River, in which that he doesn't believe in any in any uh, Palestinian state in the West Bank. Professor Abu Sada, I was reading a statement by Mahmoud Abbas, uh, and, and he, President Mahmoud Abbas has said uh, that Netanyahu is not a man who believes in peace. Now, this is quite a sweeping statement. There must be a good rationale behind it. Help us to comprehend the statement. What exactly does he mean when he says he is uh, not a right man who believes in peace? Well, thanks very much for asking this question. And let me say that uh, President, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas uh, knows uh, Netanyahu probably more than any other, is, uh, any other uh, Palestinian. Uh, President Mahmoud Abbas has dealt with many Israeli prime ministers, uh, 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 Ariel Sharon uh, in the early uh, uh, 2000, 2001, he dealt with Netanyahu, he dealt with uh, Yehud Olmert, and he also dealt with the uh, uh, current Israeli government. So he knows Netanyahu uh, more than any other Israeli prime minister. And uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, Netanyahu has been in office for more than uh, 15 years already. And uh, when Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas says that Netanyahu is not a man of peace, uh, because he knows, he knows that Netanyahu uh, uh, was behind the uh, 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 stalemate in the Palestinian-Israeli peace negotiation. Uh, Netanyahu, from the beginning, was not devoted to any peace with the Palestinians. He was devoted to the uh, 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 end of, of uh, uh, the peace process. He was devoted to uh, uh, more settlement expansion in the Palestinian territories. Uh, he has never... Uh, accepted the notion of a Palestinian state on the 1967 borders. And that's why Palestinian president has called him uh, uh, not a man of peace because of his radical right-wing ideology, which is devoted to the creation of greater Israel, in which he believes that the land of Palestine belonged to the Jews and that this land was given to the Jews by God. And therefore, he doesn't believe that Israel is in, in, in a position to relinquish uh, 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 the West Bank to the Palestinians. He very much believes in annex the annexation of uh, uh, parts of the West Bank. We, let me remind you that when he was, the last time he was prime minister, uh, back in 2021, 20 uh, he uh, supported and pushed for the so-called deal of the century by the American President Donald Trump, which was uh, designed to annex uh, big parts of the West Bank and give it to the state of Israel. That's why uh, uh, we, the Palestinians, do not believe that Netanyahu is a man of peace and he's not willing to make peace with the Palestinians. He is more uh, 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 devoted uh, to the death of any uh, uh, Palestinian state on the 1967 territory. I have a tougher question for you, uh, Professor Abu Sada. Now, given the situation that we have, we see Israel, you know, involved in heinous war crimes. And we see the people of Palestine who are actually looking for, for some room. Um, and they're unable to stop the brutality by the state of Israel. 
Now, the political administration of West Bank, does it serve any purpose or has it been able to serve any purpose for people of, of Palestine? Well, let me say that uh, since the UN has decided in 1947 to divide historic Palestine into two states, one Palestinian state and one Jewish state, uh, the Palestinians and the international community uh, prescribed to the two-state solution, and the uh, 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 the international community says that the two-state solution is the only uh, solution on the table. And we, the Palestinians, the Palestinian leadership, and the Palestinian people have uh, 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 fought for more than half a century to put an end to the Israeli occupation of their land and to the creation of a Palestinian independent and sovereign state. Now, unfortunately, uh, uh, neither the international community nor the Palestinians have succeeded in putting an end to the Israeli occupation and establishing a Palestinian state. And that is because of the, the uh, policies of the right-wing governments in Israel. And Netanyahu is one of those right-wing leaders who, uh, have, who has uh, uh, made it uh, impossible for the two-state solution. Uh, another issue is that the Israelis over the past half century, since the occupation of West Bank in 1967, has created uh, tens of Israeli settlements where we now uh, have uh, more than 130 Israeli settlements in the West Bank, which uh, 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 and also in East Jerusalem, which is according to international law, is, is part of the occupied uh, West Bank. And over the past 50 years, Israel has uh, 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 transferred more than 700,000 Israeli Jews from, from Israel into the West Bank, where we very much have one-fourth uh, of the population of the West Bank are Israeli Jews. And the creation of this Israeli settlement and bypass roads and two legal systems in the West Bank has, has very much... Uh, made it uh, uh, made Israel an apartheid state where Israel basically uh, deals in two different policies, two different legal laws. One is designed to the Israeli Jews who live in the West Bank, and another set of laws are designed to deal with the Palestinians who live under Israeli occupation. What I'm trying to say to you here is that the Israeli policies over more than half a century, which has very much uh, 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 emphasized the, the confiscation of Palestinian land, uh, uh, building Israeli settlements, expansion of settlement units, and also creating a system uh, that uh, 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 isolate the Palestinians in, 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 in their own cities and their own towns, and giving uh, the Israeli Jews the upper hand in the West Bank, that has led to the uh, uh, facts on the ground, or a complete faith right now, where uh, we very much uh, uh, find it almost hard for the creation of a contiguous and uh, 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 stable Palestinian state in the future because of the Israeli settlement expansion and Israeli uh, system of bypass roads in the West Bank. But Professor, many in, in the West would say that the political disintegration of people of Palestine is a major reason why they have not been able to have an impact on, on, on Israel. What do you say about it? Do you actually believe that the disintegration uh, within the political realm of the Palestinians has a bit of responsibility for the failure of their efforts? Well, let me say that the Palestinians from the beginning have decided to fight back against the Israeli occupation since the Palestinian Nakba, which took place in 1948, when Israel expelled more than uh, two-thirds of the Palestinian people from their own uh, homes and villages uh, into the neighboring Arab countries, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, and also into the West Bank and Gaza, uh, the Palestinians have utilized all possible ways to fight the Israeli occupation and uh, to uh, 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 reach uh, uh, self-rule for their own uh, self in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. Now, uh, yes, the Palestinians have been divided lately over the, the past 15 years uh, that we have two Palestinian factions who have been uh, competing against each other. Fatah in the West Bank, Hamas is in Gaza, and the Palestinian political divide between Hamas and Fatah has, gave, has given Israel an excuse 
to say that the Palestinians are divided, the Palestinians are not interested in peace, and uh, uh, that the Palestinian Authority ruled by President Mahmoud Abbas has no control over Gaza, and therefore that Israel can make no peace with the Palestinians. Let me say that this is just an Israeli excuse because uh, uh, the negotiations between the Palestinians and Israel started in 1993, and the Palestinian internal divide happened in the summer of 2007, and the peace process was very much strangled by the right wing in Israel uh, 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 long before the Palestinian internal divide happened between West Bank and Gaza, between Hamas and Fatah. But let me agree with you that it, it's, it's completely a mistake by the Palestinian leaders. It's completely sad uh, to see the Palestinians divided, to see uh, uh, the Palestinians argue over how to put an end to the Israeli occupation and establish a Palestinian state, while Israel is uh, 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 going forward with its land confiscation, with its uh, uh, policies and practices in the West Bank and Gaza, which uh, 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 keeping its colonization and occupation of the Palestinian people and Palestinian land. And what has been the biggest problem for Israel in the region? Because we have seen Israel ironing out its differences with many Arab states. So do you believe there are any international challenges left for Israel in the region? We, we do not see uh, the same degree of animosity for Israel in the neighboring Arab nations, and I'll not name any one of them. Uh, well, let me tell you that the threats that face Israel, not because uh, 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 Israel is uh, 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 um, a strange uh, uh, state in this Middle East region that doesn't belong to this region when it was created in 1948, but let me also tell you that the practices of Israel as a, an occupation state, as a colonial state, against the Palestinians and also against the holy, sacred places, Muslims and Christian places in East Jerusalem, uh, uh, that uh, has made is singled Israel as a threat to the region and a threat to the stability of the region. Now, as a result of that, the, 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 the Arab countries uh, have decided uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to isolate Israel, to boycott Israel right after the Israeli occupation of Palestinian and Arab land in 1967. And gradually, we have seen a number of Arab countries who signed peace with Israel, first Jordan, then uh, first, uh, first uh, Egypt, then Jordan. And we have seen two years ago a number of Arab countries normalize relations with Israel, like United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco. But until this moment, the majority of the Arab countries have not signed peace with Israel. And uh, Israel basically consider Iran as the number one threat to its national security and to its uh, 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 existence uh, because of the Iranian political discourse against Israel and also because of uh, Iranian support to uh, Arab and Palestinian resistance groups in the region, whether it's Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad in Palestine, or its support for the Syrian regime, or its support for the Houthis in Yemen. So Israel very much uh, consider Iran as the number one threat to its national security. But the, the, the main threat to the stability of the region is Israel and its colonial and occupation policies against the, the Palestinians and also against the region where Israel is very much a destabilizing state of the Middle East region. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abu Sada, for being guest in my program. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem of Israel and Palestine will continue to prevail. The people of Palestine are still looking for a solution, are still looking for being heard by the international community. Let us see how long the international community keeps its silence, its criminal silence that is causing life losses for people of Palestine every day. We'll join you next week with another program. And until then, Allah Hafiz.